I'm Professor Christopher Durso. I teach on the Northridge campus, government professor. Nice to meet you all. D David Albert. I teach mostly at Riverside, also one class at this campus a semester, and yes, professor of government, and glad to meet you. My name is Carl Mullen. I am a professor of government, and I teach at the Highland Center and one uh, uh, high school class at Crockett. All right, and I am um, Shannon Senegal, and I teach at the Elgin campus. Hello, I'm Christy Kelly. I am a government professor at Northridge. Okay, so hit it. All right. So um, first, of, first two, we're going to talk about foreign policy issues, and then I think we're getting into some domestic policy issues with what guns and immigration, and then Christy at the end is going to talk to us about elections. So hopefully it'll all come together nicely. So and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. Um, so I do have one, one PowerPoint slides up, up there because my students would know that I, I don't know how to, I can't lecture without, without PowerPoint and without my, my PowerPoint projector um, thing. <laughs> okay, but we're going to also ask questions, David. So okay, get, okay. Don't get too comfortable up there. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so, uh, so, so now compared to domestic policy, Presidents have a lot more freedom and control over foreign policy. There's much fewer checks and balances against what they can do in the realm of foreign policy. You know, we're in, foreign, in, in domestic policy, like on healthcare, Congress has a much greater role to play. But the, I, one of the ironies about this is that voters don't think a lot about foreign policy when selecting a president. Um, you know, they, they're just, they're not that focused on it. And they're not that focused on presidents having background and experience in foreign policy. Uh, so it, it's kind of disturbing in a way. Six of the last seven presidents had virtually no experience in foreign policy. I mean, if you, uh, four of them were governors. So that's um, Carter, Reagan, uh, Clinton, and George W. Bush had been governors, never held federal office, never engaged in foreign policy. Barack Obama was a freshman senator with only just a little bit of experience on the Foreign Affairs Committee. And Donald Trump, his, well, zero governmental experience and basically he knew how to negotiate hotel deals abroad but no foreign policy experience so um, but there's something really remarkable that's happening at this moment of what we call the changing presidency Trump is remaking American foreign policy and breaking with decades of what I'll call the bipartisan consensus about foreign policy so that's what I want to examine and what I put up here on this chart for you so um, and so I want to contrast what has been, it's not a complete consensus, but there was a lot of agreement between Democrats and Republicans on foreign policy issues for many decades, broadly, about certain areas. And Trump has upset that apple cart to a, a really remarkable degree. So let me just, what I want to do is kind of go through some of that here. Um, in terms of uh, engagement abroad, that is, there used to be an idea of internationalism that was very standard, Democrats and Republicans, that the United States should be engaged abroad as a global superpower. This was existed during the Cold War, it continued to a, a great extent after the Cold War, I'd say particularly in the Middle East, but also in East Asia. And um, under Trump, we've moved, I wouldn't say completely to isolationism, but a few, some steps in that direction, and a real retreat from superpower status that we saw, we've seen in this, la particularly in this last couple of weeks, where we abandoned our Kurdish allies, uh, or Trump abandoned our Kurdish, Kurdish allies in Syria, and just sort of said, okay, the Russians can take care of that. The Russians and the Turks will take care of that. And there was even a line about, um, you know, we shouldn't be worried about what happens 7,000 miles away, was one of his comments. And he's sort of reducing American role abroad in international engagements. I, I, I think he might actually like to event get to an area of sort of 1920s, 1930s style isolationism. Well, uh, it's not entirely clear, because, I mean, honestly, we, we are trying to give a logic and a rationale to Trump foreign policy, which is often irrational, I would say. Um, on working with allies, the, for years there was a belief in what's called multilateralism, which is working closely with democratic allies in Europe, with the NATO alliance, with other, other uh, allies around the world with international organizations and international agreements. Trump 
despises that kind of stuff. He goes to these conferences, to the NATO conferences, and he, he doesn't like talking to people like the German Chancellor Merkel or the French President Macron. He doesn't like these people. He, you know, they don't like him, to be honest. Uh, they, you know, and, and just, to, yeah. just to be fair about this, he ran on yeah. the ticket, right, on the Republican ticket, saying that he wanted to pull the United States out of the UN, right, and made a lot of these yeah, statements he pretty mentioned, clear. And he's, he's made references to pulling out of NATO. Yeah. I mean, NATO, North American Treaty Organization is basically the most successful military alliance in, in world history of the United States and, and European countries working together uh, to initially against Russia and the Soviet Union in the Cold War, but, but since then, the alliance of Western de democracies, you know, he's not interested in that. He doesn't like that. He doesn't like working with a, a bunch of, uh, uh, of other democratic allies. He's pulled out of international agreements, two in particular, well, uh, the, the uh, uh, TPP, which is a couple of lines down there under trade, but the, the uh, uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, but also the Paris Climate Change Accord that Obama negotiated, the Iran nuclear deal. He's pulled out of all of this stuff that was negotiated by, uh, you know, before he said, yeah, it doesn't like these organizations. So very much more unilateralism. There was a thread of that in the Republican politics before, but much more so. Uh, he, every president leading up to him was, would always talk about promoting democracy abroad. George Bush, uh, George W. Bush was really big on promoting democracy abroad, at least rhetorically, and promoting human rights. Now, they didn't always actually do that, but they at least talked about it. They at least set the standard uh, for the world as democracy and human rights. And Trump never talks about democracy, never talks about human rights. The, the biggest example is the, uh, when, people remember when Jamal Khashoggi, a uh, uh, Saudi Arabian journalist who lived in the United States and worked for the Washington Post, was murdered. He walked into a, a, a Saudi embassy in, I can't remember if it was Ankara or Istanbul, uh, but in, in Turkey, and he was literally cut up with knives and, uh, and bone cutters and murdered, and Trump's response was, eh, we don't care. You know, the, the Congress was more upset about it, and, and there were some, uh, you know, efforts there, but he didn't care. He didn't even make a pretense of caring about the murder of, of, of this journalist and the, the, what that says about freedom of the press. And um, on trade, again, a global consens a consensus for years was free trade agreements like NAFTA, GATT, TPP that you see up there. Um, he is much more protectionist. Doesn't like big international agreements with multiple countries. Uh, you know, he wants to, to negotiate specific agreements with individual countries, and he, he loves trade wars. His fa one of, a famous tweet on that was, trade wars are easy to win. They aren't. And if you've followed anything about the trade war with China, it has been nasty. It's hurting farmers and manufacturers and lots of, pe of people in the United States by raising tariffs, which are essential. He says the Chinese are paying, but actually hurt our own people, because they're basically end up being taxes on Americans, um, the, uh, which he denies, because he denies a lot of facts. Immigration, now uh, we're gonna have a, another speaker that talks about immigration in great, greater detail, but he, again, uh, there used to be you know, broad support for, um, you know, since the Immigration Bill of 1965 raised the, the quotas, uh, you know, for lots of immigrants coming in, a sort of, you know, I mean, it goes back, you know, in American history, it's sort of m the mythology of the Statue of Liberty, the welcoming of immigrants, and this administration is the most hostile to immigration we've seen in a very long time, you know, both to undocumented immigration, but also, uh, uh, you know, it was cutting, they cut the numbers on refugee resettlement from, I believe it was 110,000 under Obama, next year it's going to be uh, 18,000. And, but also to legal immigration, to, to the effect that one of, the, of their people, um, Ken Cuccinelli, said something like, you know, give me your tired, your poor, who can, who can pay their own way, was his comment. So very, and trying to change all sorts of legal immigration laws, because really what this is, is, is they want to increase the boundaries of the United States, the sovereignty of the United States. Uh, and literally the, the figurative idea of building walls to keep the rest of the world out. They, they, they want you know, to defend American sovereignty and nationalism. And 
uh, which goes to the next line there, is nationalism versus globalization. The economy of the world is globalizing, and the approach has very much been more towards international cooperation and viewing our relations with the other, rest of the world as shared interests. Trump's approach, you, you heard it during the campaign, America first, which is actually a phrase that has a really nasty background into the 1930s and sort of almost uh, a very, well, the America firsters were basically pro-Nazi and I'm not saying that that's what it means here, but that was actually what that term implied back in the 1930s. But, you know, but it's the idea of our nation first and foremost, we don't care about cooperating with other nations, only our national interests matter, not those shared interests that we might have with other countries. And that connects to things like rejecting the international organizations, international agreements. You know, he doesn't see that we, like on an issue like global climate change, we have a shared interest with other countries in reducing global emissions. Uh, you know, it's, you know, it's us first and nobody else matters. And then the last uh, uh, second to the bottom line I have there is, and I think this is critical, the process has broken down in terms of foreign policy making under Trump. The, if you go back to other administrations, you talk to people from for, uh, previous administrations, they considered policy issues carefully. They had inter, what are called interagency working groups of scholars and experts who discussed issues and presented presidents with alternatives. They had, the president would get an extensive morning briefing from the CIA every morning. He'd have all sorts of briefing books, none of that. I mean, I don't know if he gets any CIA briefing. Have you heard? Is any? So remember the beginning of his administration? He wasn't even showing up to his uh, National Briefings. Security Council meeting. Yeah. Like he had no interest in foreign policy. Yeah, I mean, he, had, he has very l limited, if any, briefings. You know, they don't give him anything more than a page to read, as what I've heard. It's very, you know, he's not, um, you know, it's not, there's no careful and considered decision making and he personalizes everything. He calls these foreign leaders, and, and you know, this is where he got in trouble in Ukraine and also this recent issue with Turkey, is a you know, foreign leader called him, and frankly, the foreign leaders have figured out that what you do is you praise him, you play to his ego, and he'll give you what you want. So you know, that's what their intelligence people tell them. So, you know, so with the Ukraine, what did he want? He wanted them to, um, to give him dirt on Joe Biden, and he basically implicitly threatened them with uh, threatened not to give them military aid unless they gave him dirt, which was also ba which was based on a conspiracy theory. And then uh, this whole thing where they pulled uh, out of, of protecting the Kurds in Syria that was based on a phone call with President Erdogan uh, uh, of Turkey, and in in that um, that call he just uh, Erdogan rolled him basically. And he just came out on Twitter and said, okay, we're pulling out, we're, we're abandoning our Kurdish allies. You know, he didn't talk to experts, he didn't talk to his own military, the State Department, foreign allies. It was like, he made a decision. I mean, and he loves to talk to these sorts of people, to foreign leaders, particularly the more authoritarian, the better. Because authoritarian leaders can just make deals with him. The, and it's like a real estate deal. You know, he can, they can just make a deal, you know, they can just, agree to something, they don't have to go check with, with, with Congress or Parliament or anything, they can just do it. So, uh, so I have a summary line here, I don't know if you can see it, uh, that the American foreign policy has sort of followed what Teddy Roosevelt said for many years, uh, talk softly and carry a big stick. The idea of ta talk softly, have diplomacy, and carry a big stick and have a military threat behind that. I, I recently heard a journalist, uh, Mara Lyce in the NPR, rephrase that, that for Trump it has changed to talk, talks loudly and carries a small twig, which means he just talks very loudly and tweets and threatens, but he's, uh, the small twig refers to the idea that he's not very willing to use American military policy, m m power, even though they have poured a lot of money into the military since he came, came in. And, you know, he said the military was in shambles, it wasn't, and they poured more money into it, but he's very hesitant to use American power, and they know it. So they know that it's an empty threat, and that's one of the reasons that uh, a lot of other countries are not taking him very seriously. Uh, so 
I want to close by just speculating a little bit as to what, what are his motivations. Um, to, because a, a president is supposed to, you know, typically administrations have pursued foreign policies based on American national interests. And I don't think that's quite, that's what Trump is doing. Um, you know, the, now there have always been differences between Democrats and Republicans in how they define American national interests, but there's generally been that idea. Now, they also, um, and there was always some role for domestic politics. Uh, actually, my dissertation was on that because I was writing about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the role of uh, domestic politics in shaping that. But it's much more so now because what I'd argue is every decision he makes is about domestic politics. He has no concern for the national interest, really. Uh, it's about satisfying the desires of his political base in playing up nationalistic themes, populist themes, a lot of playing, particularly in immigration, to racism, religious bigotry, if you remember the travel ban against Muslim countries, uh, opposition to globalization, diversity, xenophobia. I think all of those are playing in uh, his tendency to want to work with authoritarian leaders who are easier for him to deal with. And I, I actually think another element, that, and we saw it in this controversy a few days ago over bringing his, the G7 summit to his own uh, resort in uh, Florida, the Doral Resort, uh, another secondary influence, I think, is his own interest in his own personal profits for his businesses. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of the people that he works with are, you know, like on Turkey, he has... A, a twin tower, Trump Towers in Istanbul, uh, and he wanted to build a Trump Tower in Moscow. I think a lot of, of his personal business interests are, are playing into this. So unlike previous presidents, he has no separation between his personal interests and the national interest. For him, they're combined, they're identical. What's good for Trump is good for America, in, in his mind. And you know, again, you saw that with Ukraine, where he was just, you know, uh, I'll use the you know American funds and military aid to benefit myself, to benefit my political campaigns. So there's a real redefinition of American foreign policy going on along these lines. Um, we, when we get to elections, we can talk about whether this will continue past this administration. Uh, I mean, we will see whether these are permanent changes or temporary changes. But I, I will leave it there and turn it over to my colleagues. So. Uh, and I guess we'll have, we'll take questions later. Okay. Uh, so I'll ask you to cooperate for a moment here. Um, by a show of hands, uh, who could identify the Prime Minister of Canada? The President of China? The Chancellor of Germany? Okay. How about the President of South Africa or Bolivia? I'm not in trying to put you on the spot, so I won't ask any individual person to name these uh, political leaders. Uh, but what percentage of individuals in those countries and others do you think could identify who is President of the United States? Would you say it'd be higher than 80%? probably even higher than that, right? And the reason for this is because the President of the United States is not just a domestic figure, they're an international political figure. It is the most visible political office in the entire world, which means the actions and policies of the President of the United States do not just affect Americans, as we see daily, they affect people globally as well. But that also means that we, the American people who elect those leaders, are responsible for the actions and choices that they make. After the 9-11 attacks, a journalist interviewed Osama bin Laden. He asked him a question. He said, why did you kill 3,000 innocent Americans? And bin Laden said, what kind of political system do they have in the United States? And the journalist said, well, representative democracy. So bin Laden said, so the, my understanding is that the American people then freely chose their president. So therefore, they're just as guilty as that president is. 
foreign policy doesn't happen in a vacuum. It has consequences both internationally and domestically. Political actors, political decision makers, most of whom in international politics, particularly in, de in developed countries, are what we call realists, tend to be very much focused on promoting the national interest of the country that they represent. Now, the consequences are relevant because you, in particular, as the future, are going to have to deal with a lot of these consequences. We will as well, but in particular, you as the future will be dealing with the sort of damage of those consequences of these foreign policy decisions. Now, when I think of the foreign policy, I was asked to talk about the foreign policy of Donald Trump. When I think about it, a lot of adjectives come to mind. Erratic, dysfunctional, chaotic, schizophrenic, uh, spontaneous. Because part of the reason for this does, as David mentioned, have to do with his complete lack of political and foreign policy experience. It also has to do with his management style, which he thinks sort of seamlessly adjust to conducting foreign policy, which often ends up in him weakening and undermining the very people that he appoints to assist him in conducting foreign policy, particularly Secretary of State. Um, but what comes mind to mind most of all when I think of the foreign policy of Donald Trump is Hobbesian. And I think he has a Hobbesian view of the world. I think to him the world truly is poor, solitary, nasty, brutish, and short. And that's how he sees international politics and in some ways probably how he sees life in general. And so as a result of this, um, his attitude to foreign policy is that it's a zero-sum game. And if you don't know what that means, in international politics it means if one country wins, another has to lose. So for Donald Trump, the idea of collective action to achieve consensus to solve common problems like global warming uh, is something that he can't understand because it involves collective consensus type action that is fundamentally antithetical to how he sees the world. There are winners and losers and for him you have to be a winner and if you're not a winner you're a loser and it's just that simple. So when he talks about, as David mentioned, this concept of America first, his attitude toward that is uh, that he will seek to maximize gains for the United States while seeking to minimize gains for others. But he often sort of um, tries to disguise that with statements such as, that's what I expect those countries to do as well. It makes sense. They should also be seeking to maximize their gains in conducting foreign policy. The reality, however, is slightly different because all presidents in the United States historically, whether Democratic administrations or Republican administrations, have always taken an America first approach to foreign policy. This is not a new concept with Donald Trump. What's new about it is that, or what the variation is, is that Democratic administrations like the Obama administration and to some degree the Clinton administration, they at least make an attempt to um, share the benefits of international politics so that the United States still has to gain more in conducting foreign policy, but other countries can at least gain something. But with many Republican administrations, and certainly this one, that sort of philosophy becomes uh, a much more of a, a, a very sort of rigid realist approach which at all expense the United States must maximize their gains and therefore other countries unless they have the same ability to play the game of international politics on the same level to be as competitive economically, militarily, etc. Uh, then they get left behind. But this isn't, you know, this, David spoke a lot about the sort of international political system this system that we currently occupy is one that's been in existence since 1991-92 in the fall of the Soviet Union. We moved from a bipolar global order to a unipolar global order, what we call a hegemonic system, a one superpower. And that superpower, of course, in some ways by default, is the United States of America because we still have militarily and economically greater 
uh, capacity and authority than all other countries who may or may not be seeking to challenge us. But this consensus has been built around really two fundamental ideas that the United States in the post-World War II period helped to construct but was unable to achieve internationally because of opposition by the Soviets, and that was liberal democratic order and free trade or free market capitalism. But since 91 and President George H.W. Bush put the world on notice with the creation of what he called the New World Order, the U.S. was establishing that in this hegemonic system, our, our policies and our ideas with relation to economic policy, trade policy, military policy, political policy, was the only acceptable policy. And if a country deviated from that policy and didn't come to adopt those norms as their own, they are labeled pariahs, rogue states, unreliable actors. And so what countries will often do in these circumstances, as the United States routinely does under both Trump and previous administrations, is exercise a combination of what former Harvard government professor Joseph Nye called hard and soft power. Soft power, basically the usage of sanctions, primarily economic sanctions, the use of trade negotiations to squeeze countries economically to change their behavior, to try to bring them back into the accepted global consensus of what is appropriate economic and political values. And then if that doesn't work, there's always the option of hard power, which is just straight out military intervention, which as Joseph Nye, I think correctly observed, should always be a last resort. But make no mistake, the US in being the dominant hegemonic power since 91 has sought to and has achieved in creating a consensus about whether it's the World Trade Organization, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank or the United Nations, that our political values, our economic values, should be the global political values and global economic values. And what we're seeing over the last few years is that that consensus is starting to break down because countries like China and Russia and Iran and others don't accept that that is the only system that can be applied to international politics. And so the United States is sort of scrambling to figure out how can it try to exercise influence over these equally or almost as equally powerful nations? And in many cases, we simply can't. But one grave mistake that US foreign policy has often made is the assumption that certain countries don't have a right to have a spot at the table, like a Russia, for example. Russia is a country that should never, ever, under any circumstances, be treated as a second-rate power. When a country has more than 12,000 nuclear warheads and has 11 time zones, it's never a second-rate power. And so as a consequence of this, I do think that one area where the Trump doctrine, if you will, actually makes a little bit of sense is that countries like Russia shouldn't be ignored. Now, you don't want to be a sort of patsy of Russia. That's not a good approach to take, but simultaneously, reaching out to a country like Russia, reaching out to a North Korea or an Iran, actually it can be very beneficial and advantageous. Um, one of the long sort of grievances that I've always had of foreign policy circles, something I've had some experience in, is it's often filled with a lot of well-intentioned people to some degree who have a lot of really established credentials and fancy degrees, but who can't fix anything because they can't think outside the box to save their lives because they're so conditioned about what they should believe and how they should approach international politics that it prohibits any kind of resolution. I could put pretty much every one of you in this classroom here into a room probably with a classroom of Iranian students and you guys could find consensus relatively easily because you don't have the emotional, psychological baggage that goes along with the same leaders that are recycled in and out of the foreign policy decision-making process. Now, the Trump administration, sure, they are upending, as David said, the apple cart to some degree. He conducts foreign policy the way he conducts pretty much everything else he does. It's sort of fly by the seat of your pants because he doesn't know what he's doing when it comes to foreign policy. His, his, his movements are often 
irrational and sporadic, and he moves from uh, one idea to, to the next relatively quickly. Now, some have suggested maybe there's some method to that madness. Maybe he's trying to keep uh, opponents of the United States off balance to some degree. And perhaps that's true. Uh, but you have to, the one thing you always have to, as a political leader, particularly of the United States, keep in mind when you're conducting foreign policy is what are you trying to achieve? And so I think this is where the Trump administration struggles more than anything else because they don't, ha he doesn't at least have an answer to that question other than adulation for his already rather narcissistic ego. Um, he doesn't really know what it is that he's trying to achieve. He wants to be viewed as someone, I guess, that has a legacy of making a deal with North Korea, but that's just so fundamentally beyond any kind of practical reality because the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un is not stupid. He saw what happened to the former Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi when he agreed to, up to give his nuclear weapons program up. That was the end of his administration, his dictatorship, and then his life. And Kim Jong-un knows that this is the one thing he has that will keep him in power, so he's not about to give that up. So just by stepping across the demilitarized zone into North Korea, and saying, hey, we really get along, isn't going to convince him to give up his nuclear weapons program. So I think it's, it's very much a um, sort of spontaneous, kind of like my presentation to you today, approach to foreign policy that the Trump administration takes. But what I'm much more concerned about is how are we as a country, the United States, as the global hegemon, going to adjust this moving into the future so that it serves the interest and needs not just of political elites, not just of economic elites, not just of the G7 countries, but of all Americans, and quite frankly, all of the people in the rest of this place we call planet Earth, because they also have a stake in this, because they are impacted and affected by the decisions of the United States as well. But if you want to see change in terms of U.S. foreign policy, it starts with actually taking individual action, and you do have power. And the power that you have begins with this. You can change your habits of consumption, what kind of clothes we wear, what kind of consumer goods we buy, what kind of electronic devices we purchase. That is relevant. Because why do you think the United States of America has more than 700 military bases spread across the entire globe? What's the main reason for this? It's to protect the economic interests of the United States. Right? Didn't we see President Trump just say, we don't need to keep troops in Syria anymore because we've protected the oil? So the reality is, individually, we do have power because we can change our habits of consumption. And if we change that, then we can change the foreign policy decisions that right now are focused on maintaining and perpetuating a global political system in which the developed countries continue to win, often at the expense of the underdeveloped countries. And Donald Trump is really just in many ways a perpetuation of that system, but in his radically sort of apocalyptic, dysfunctional way. Thank you. Okay. I need to stand my apparatus. You when you get old, you have to move about. Guys, my name is Carl Mullen, and I'm going to talk to you about the role of race and ethnicity in the history of U.S. immigration policy. You know, most of us think about immigrant, immigration and immigration policy based on what we see at the Statue of Liberty, give me your tired, uh, yearn, hold on masses, yearning to be free, you know. Well, that's true. That's the, that is the Hollywood version of it. But the realistic version of it, well, give me your tired, yearning, whole masses, if they look a certain way. Because throughout the entire history of this country, the immigration policy has been largely driven by race. And the, the individuals uh, from the very beginning, there was only one period when we had what you can say, give me your tired, yearning, huddle masses, anyone. And that was in the very beginning of the country where we, we had what was known as an open door policy. If you remember from your history, the country was started, well, the Constitution started with that in 1679. And then during those early years, we had a truly open door policy. 
because we had all of this un uh, undeveloped land that we needed someone to come in and help settle it. So during that period, everybody is welcome. Okay, so that was during the open door policy. Now one thing about the United States uh, immigration policy is, in spite of the fact that we are a country that have immigrants from all over the world, relatively speaking, we have been able to live in peace and harmony and sing kumbaya with the exception of maybe one period, the Civil War. And hopefully we won't have anything like that in our lifetime. Definitely not in mine, but you have to realize I'm 66 years old, so my horizon is pretty short. So maybe it definitely not in yours. But you end up having, John F. Kennedy said that America is not only a nation, it is a nation of nations. And that was the title of his book when he, that he wrote when he was a senator in 1958. And by that he meant that if you look at the history of this country, yes, people have come from all over the world, different continents, different countries. And the, you can pretty much put it in three different ways. You can say the first wave, we had an open door policy. We ended up having the primary immigrants who came to this country was from Northwestern European countries. Countries like, I'm gonna put on my glasses here, countries like Great Britain, Ireland, Germany, Scandinavia. That was the first wave during the early 1800s to mid 1800s. Now you remember that open door policy started with the beginning after the Constitution and then from the early 1800s to the mid, we had the first wave of immigrants who came from Northwestern European countries. And now during this same period, it was during this period in the, uh, between it was really with the second wave. The second wave came in from Southeastern Europe. That was from 18, late 1800s to early 1900s. They came from uh, countries like Italy, Poland, Russia, and there were a lot of Jews. Now if you notice, compare those, compare the second wave with the first wave. Northwestern European, Britain, uh, British, Irish, and Germans and Scandinavia. Pretty much they're in uh, uh, a group of people who probably like to go to the beach and get a suntan during the summertime. <laughs> the second group, a little bit the Italian, the Poles, and you begin to get a little more, not true diversity because they are still Anglo, but as far as complexion, maybe you have a little bit darker skin tone. And it was during the period of 1875 and I will get to the third wave, which is some of the people who look like us up here on the stage and some of you out there in the audience. But the, the first time that the United States enacted a true immigration act that was known to target certain individuals who we want to let in. And that was the Page Act of 1875. The Page Act targeted, say, there are some people we don't want in here. And they used the phrase, undesirables. Now, there's some of the undesirables that they went out and said, you know, the, we don't want some of these undesirables coming in. They first they said, well, we don't want criminals and prostitutes. Well, you know, most of your probably, well, I'll get to that in a second. <laughs> okay, we don't want, uh, we prohibited individuals from bringing oriental persons, oriental persons without their free and voluntary consent. And the third uh, uh, category is it, the uh, Page Act declared the contracting to supply, quote, coolie labor is a felony. Now this was in 1875. Does anyone know what the word coolie? Y'all never heard of that? Does any, can anyone tell me what coolie is? It's a slur for Chinese. You've probably heard Archie, well, you know, you see Archie Bunker on your reruns. When Bar Archie Bunker used to say chinks, <laughs> that, was, that was basically someone from Chinese origin. So we don't want uh, anyone who brings in coolie labor, you're guilty of a felony. Now note, this is in 1875. We're identifying, we don't want the, we don't want the, uh, the crooks, we don't want the prostitutes, we don't want the, uh, 
the uh, the uh, coolie laborers and people of Oriental descent. Now, if you imagine about when you come to the the crooks and the prostitutes, there will be a lot of rap artists today that would be broke if they couldn't use the lyri in their lyrics, crooks and hoes. And I'm sure you probably would agree with that, that yeah, yeah, they use those words in virtually every song they write. But anyway, that was, in the, that was a group that we wanted to keep out in 1875, identified in the law. And the word coolie was, a, that's part of the actual law. Anyone who bring in a coolie, you're guilty of a felony. Now it's kind of ironic that that is in 1875 and then in 1869, six years earlier, the Transcontinental Railroad had just been completed. And you know who built the, who in a large part built the Transcontinental Railroad? Chinese. It was those coolers that we don't want coming in here anymore. So now you end up having this like, is that just an accident? Well, or just, just a coincidence. Um, was that a method to the madness? And uh, you'll see later on in our era, in your time, it's a method to the madness. So you end up having from 1875 until 1882, it got a little bit more explicit in 1872. There was another immigration uh, law that was passed called the Chinese Exclusion Act. Now, it's pretty explicit as to who they want to keep out there. The first, the, the, the Page Act was in large part aimed at keeping out Chinese females who would frequently be engaged in prostitution to, while the, 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 the men worked on the railroad for relaxation, they would bring in some Chinese females. So you end up having a situation whereby now we're just going to target the Chinese to be excluded from coming in, period. We're going to name you. And that law stayed into effect until 1924. And I want to make sure that I cover everything under the Chinese in, in, uh, uh, Exclusion Act. Because first of all, it says, in addition to Chinese exclusion, we don't want convicts, we don't want lunatics, we don't want idiots, and any person unable to take charge of himself or herself without being a public charge. That's a nice way of saying, anyone we let in, we don't want you, they didn't have Section 8 and food stamps during that era. We don't want you going on the public dole. You need to be self-sufficient, independent, and self-reliant. Pull yourself up by the bootstrap, even though you came here with some sh without shoes, looking for a better opportunity. But pull yourself up by the bootstrap. So you had a situation whereby the Chinese Exclusion Act explicitly targeted the Chinese to be excluded. Now, you end up having another law in 1924. Before you, before you go on, wasn't, I believe the act also said that Chinese who came in could never become citizens. That is States. correct. I didn't want to go through all of the notes, but you're exactly right. Yeah. Nor could their own property. They so yeah, we want to make sure you keep we keep you in your place, call it boy. Just a just a I always like to throw in a little humor to see if you're still paying attention. By the fact you didn't laugh, I don't know if you're sleeping or you're texting or you're just not understanding what I'm saying. But I'll throw in something like that periodically. So you end up having the Johnson Reed Act of 1924. Now this is what the Johnson Reed Act did. It said we are going to establish quotas for certain countries that we want to come into this country. We're gonna give affirmative action preference as to who we let in. And those quotas, now they, remember, the act was passed in 1924. But for the criteria of the quota, we're gonna go back to the census of 1890. During that first wave, you remember I said that first wave considered of Northwestern European people who probably would love to go to the beach and get a suntan during the summertime. So they are going all the way back to another era to decide what the quotas will be based on. Do you think that was just an accident? Probably not. But I'm saying all of that to say our immigration policy to a large degree has been driven by 
racial preferences, racial discrimination, and ethnic, uh, ethnic preferences. Okay, so you end up having Johnson Reed stayed into effect until the mid-1960s. In I was about to say all of our lifetime, but definitely not in your lifetime, but some of us on this stage life, oh my God, I'm really your aging lifetime. myself. You know. I'm the only person up here who can remember the 60s. So this was in my lifetime. I, I was born in 69, December, so. I Thanks, David. <laughs> I, I was a junior in high school when you were coming out of the womb. Oh my well, God. <laughs> but anyway, and I do this with my class. I'll say something like, you remember? And I, we weren't born then. Okay, so, but during the 1960s, in 1965, you ended up having what was known as the Heart Seller Immigration Act. This was the first time that the United States says, we are going to get rid of the quotas that was established in 1924 based on 1890 census when the country was virtually all white. And uh, by the way, I didn't, uh, I forgot to tell you, the Chinese Exclusion Act, the one that was specifically targeted for the Chinese, it was not gotten rid of until 1943. Now, I wasn't born then, so that was before all of our time. But you have a situation whereby these policies were set up in order to make the complexion or keep the complexion of a country a certain manner. Now, I'm getting to the third way, uh, Hart Sellers Act in 1965. Hart Sellers said, we're getting rid of the preference for Northwestern European uh, countries, and we're going to make a new goal for our immigration policy. Family reunification. So that means, one, we're going to start accepting people from countries or uh, continents like Africa, the Caribbeans, Asia, Central America, and all of a sudden, what was known as the melting pot of the fruit salad, some people refer to as the uh, diversity of the United States, it began to get really diverse. And look around at this class, I mean my class, look around at this room. This is a fairly diverse room. So you end up having that in large part was the result of Hart's uh, Seller Immigration Act of 1965. It ended up doing away with quotas and saying family reunification is going to be the primary objective of our, our Immigration Act. You come here from the Caribbeans, you come here from Africa, you come here from Central America, you can end up bringing your family members later on after you get established with citizenship or permanent residency. And some people refer to that today as chain migration. Y'all can imagine what a chain, you know, the links in a chain. You get here and then you reach back and just put another family member loop in that. And now all of a sudden you began to hear I don't want to say, well, yeah, you're beginning to hear an overt opposition to chain, react, uh, chain migration. Well, instead of, you can't just necessarily go back, and maybe the president can say, we don't want people from these, what was he said? Assholes country, asshole countries. Yeah, we don't want people from these asshole countries. <laughs> so maybe I was about to say, you can't go back to like it was during the early era, but maybe you can. But anyway, the, the new proposal, what, well, there was two things that happened as a result of Seller Hartman. One, the country, this was a third wave of immigrants who came here. The country began to get really diverse for two reasons. One, you had a lot of immigrants coming from continents that were never allowed to come in large numbers. Two, if you look at the birth rate of the immigrants who came here, it tends to be much higher than native, uh, native, no, Anglo-Americans who have been in this country a long time. None of you plan to have six kids like Frank and Annabelle, my parents had. If you do, I hope you have a spouse or you have some money that you inherited because they are expensive. So most of you, most of Anglo-Americans went down in terms of having the number of kids. A lot of the immigrants who come here, they still have values of having a large family. 
So you add that, the birth rate, you add uh, more members coming from different countries, and the country is expected, when I say the country, I'm talking about the United States, is expected to become a majority ethnic minority country by the mid-century. Let's say, for the sake of discussion, within your lifetime, the next 25 to 30 years, you all will be close to where I am in the next, and at that time, the whole country is expected to be a, have a numerical majority of ethnic minorities. Texas, Texas is already there. I was just gonna in say, California, Texas so, you know, other states have already gotten there. And now, all of a sudden, you hear, we need to change the immigration policy to do two things. Get rid of this chain migration. You can't bring your uncle, your cousin, or your nephew, or your, your niece. Let's just have it to the immediate family members, wife or siblings, you know, cut down. We need, and a lot of people, a lot of critics say, this is an effort to do a backdoor reverse discrimination on what Johnson, what, on what um, the Chinese exclusion and Johnson Reed ex uh, explicitly did. And have any of y'all ever heard the phrase, the browning of America? You know what that, I see someone nodding their head in the back. You know what that means, right? I see you nodding your head, and I'm looking at your demographic, your demographic features. So, yeah, obviously you know what that means. All of a sudden, that is a really big concern. Browning of America, and let's make sure that whoever we let come in don't get on the public charge. Like in an earlier era, we used this as an exclusion. And some of the new proposal that the president has made in terms of this is one of the things that he would like to have in a new immigration overhaul policy. You can come here, but we want to check you out. Do you have a degree? Preferably is your degree in one of these fields that's going, that would get you a good paying job and you can be self-sufficient. STEM, you've all heard of STEM. Do, do any of you plan to major in a STEM field? Science, technology, engineering, math. I got one STEM for your hand. <laughs> That's all. That, okay, guys, Thank if you God. all were trying to get in and you, you didn't have what she was majoring in, you might be at a disadvantage. But luckily, you're already here and you got your citizenship. But anyway, you end up having a situation whereby even in the 21st century, you see shades of some of the immigration policy and the restrictive measure that have been there since the very beginning. We just didn't know about it, or we just didn't speak about it, or we just chose to ignore it. And now, with the current president, as we were talking about earlier, everything is changing. He won't let you forget it, and he won't let you not know about it. Because he would say, we'll build a wall, and we'll overhaul our immigration policy. Now with that, something that Chris said, you guys are really gonna be the one to bring about change. And I mean, it, believe it or not, I'm sorry to say my generation, not these generation, but my generation, the baby boomers, those of us who was born between 46, 1946 and 1964, all of those soldiers came back from the uh, World War II horny as hell, got real busy, and had about 79 million babies. All of us are getting to the end of our life cycle, and we are leaving you a real mess. I mean, Chris alluded to it. I'll just be more explicit. I would love to have some of those years that you have ahead of me, but I don't want the problems that I see you're going to have to face, and I just pray you can do a better job of resolving them than we kids than we did, because we did you a disservice. And before, before you go, you're going to collect our Social Security from that. Hey, well, I've already started collecting mine. I just hope something's there for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, if I can just real quick, Carl, if I'm not mistaken, the so between 1920s, I think, late 1920s and 1960s, the level of immigration in to the United States dropped dramatically, correct? Uh, there was much I'm more restrictive question, immigration policy. I so happen to have the data here from Homeland Security. Tell me the year you want. Uh, like 20s to 60s, 1920s, 1960s. 
Yes, it did. Okay. And then uh, you mentioned the first two waves. I would say since the 60s, the present day, we've sort of had the third wave, That's predominantly correct. immigrants from Latin America. That uh, is correct. Uh, specifically. And so I just wanted to t take a moment to sort of tie that back into foreign policy because, um, you know, one of the decisions of the Trump administration last year was to suspend foreign aid to Honduras, Guatemala, and, uh, and, um, and El Salvador as a way to try to uh, sort of uh, pressure those governments to restrict uh, immigrants trying to, to, to emigrate to the United States. And this is sort of illustrates the larger problem of how foreign policy decisions can have an impact, obviously not just within the United States, but uh, abroad as well. In Latin America in particular is a region of the world that U.S. foreign policy has been uh, particularly corrosive, invasive, and impactful historically. So you would think that um, if a country's objective in conducting its foreign policy is to try to minimize immigration from those countries into your own country, uh, probably not a constructive way to go about doing that would be to deny their foreign aid, which is only going to sort of uh, weaken the already weak economic infrastructure of that country, which is only going to exacerbate the problem and give people additional reason to want to leave in the first place. So this is why sometimes sort of understanding how to connect the dots in foreign policy uh, is relevant and, 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 uh, and uh, having the right people understand how to connect those dots uh, is, is advantageous. And if I can just add uh, one other line. The, uh, so Carl described the waves of immigration and how the country has changed dramatically. I would say the Trump administration and a lot of the people that voted for him is a, is a backlash against that multiculturalism, diversity and, uh, of the United States. And when he talks about you know, so, uh, nationalism and building walls and building sovereignty, that is a rejection of a, rea a reaction against the, all the effects of the immigration bill from 1965 that have changed America dramatically and is making America into a, a very different country than the people of Donald Trump's generation remember. Uh, and uh, the people that, uh, that's, uh, that, uh, that voted for Donald Trump, I think a lot of them are still angry at the fact that when they call a number they get asked, <laughs> It, it press one for English and two for Spanish. I think if, if you're angry about that, you're probably a Donald Trump voter. Well, I just want to let Shannon go, and so I'm going to end it there. But <laughs> I just think that sometimes when you sort of realize, perhaps consciously or subconsciously, that you, you've, you've uh, benefited from a, a system of white privilege and that system you see under threat, um, you, you, you find um, uh, certain political figures who uh, promise to, to try to change that, uh, perhaps more palatable than than some others would. Yeah. That's why you end up coming up with the phrase, make America great again. Again. Well, when did it stop being great? <laughs> All right, Shannon. Back, back to the 1950s. Yes. Yes. Right, I guess. All right, so I'm glad that, yes. <laughs> so I'm kind of glad that um, Carl kind of set the stage for immigration. So we're gonna, I'm gonna look at immigration today um, it kind of started with this notion of a wall. We all remember when President Trump was running first time, he was like, let's build this wall. And everybody was like, yeah, let's build a wall. All Mexico right. will pay for it. Yeah, exactly. And Mexico's going to pay for this wall. Well, <laughs> as we know, um, Mexico has refused to pay for this wall. Um, instead, uh, President Trump is going to reallocate funds so we can get this wall. Um, some of this money is coming from military and also taking money from the Corps, um, Army Corps of Engineer. And most of this money that will come from the Corps has to deal with perhaps hurricane funding. If you guys can remember Harvey, or if we could remember other hurricanes, we know that we probably need this money to save maybe for a hurricane and maybe not so much a wall. So um, like David and Chris both stated that President Trump immigration policy kind of follows this American first. How do we put America first? Well, his immigration policy kind of leads to this with this notion of a wall or we probably remember maybe a few 
years ago where we started to separate children who were coming from um, countries down south. And we would separate them and we would put them in facilities. Okay, not, I'm sorry, not a few years ago, uh, a few months ago this happened. And this kind of leads to this fact that we, these individuals should not come to this country, which kind of relates back to what Mr. Mullen was talking about, uh, about this wave trying to reduce the number of individuals that are coming here. President Trump recently passed this new uh, proclamation, and this proclamation wants to limit who could get a visa. There are several types of visas in the country that individuals can apply for. And President Trump would like to change some of the visas. One of the visas requirement that he would like to see, um, individuals should be able to get health insurance. Like, so you have to have health insurance. You should be able to speak English. You should be able to have a good job, like Mr. Mullen said, like maybe in the STEM industry, in order for you to perhaps get this visa. Um, if you cannot get health insurance within a certain time period, then you perhaps cannot be eligible to come to this country. Since when has having health care been a requirement for individuals to come? Since 2019. That's right, yeah. So this is something that's fairly new, and this perhaps could stop a number of individuals. I was reading how this may actually stop a large number of perhaps Asian Americans from coming to this country because they won't be able to get health insurance. Okay, that's, that's something that is, to me, kind of boggling. Another thing, we're probably familiar with President Trump and his travel ban. This was one of his first policies that President Trump passed, that he wants to have this travel ban to stop certain groups of individuals from coming here. Does anybody remember where most of these citizens that he banned were coming from? Middle East, yeah. Muslim countries. Muslim countries. Why? Why do you think this is the case? that he wants to have this travel ban to stop these individuals from coming. How about my colleagues up here? What do you think? Well, he wanted to change. He, he wanted to keep the composition of the country religiously pretty much like it is. Evangelical, preferably a, with their quote, right religion. You think that might have anything to do with it? And, and of course, all these people were, were also non-white, so he wants it to be white and Christian. Why do you think it has to do with perhaps helping him get reelected? Who knows? Okay, so those are just a few, I, or a few changes that President Trump um, and his, poli his foreign policy and immigration policy has to deal with. Another, he has reduced the number of individuals that can get asylum or receive asylum in this country. Does anybody know what it means to get asylum or be granted asylum? Yes, right? My bad. All right. So, Mr. Chris, what does it mean to get asylum or David? Take. Um, yeah. Basically, people who are fleeing oppression in their, their home country, uh, sometimes uh, the, a lot of people coming from the, uh, the Northern Triangle are fleeing from gang violence, sometimes domestic violence, um, civil wars, you know, any, any of those sorts of things where they're not safe in their homeland, they can come to the United States and under international law request asylum. I think I gave the numbers earlier that they reduced it from 110,000 in the Obama administration. And for next year, there was actually some thought that they were going to zero it out completely. They, they just reduced it to 18,000 from 110, so by about 90% roughly. Yeah. So all of these individuals who are trying to flee violence, they're coming to the U.S., and they're not being granted asylum. 
So what's going to happen to these individuals? Well, they're going to go back to their country, and it may not be so great for them. But that goes to this notion of putting America first. I am going to like cut my presentation a little short because we are kind of running out of time, and we will let um, Christy talk about election, and then we will have some time for questions and answers. I've actually got to stand up for this because I've been sitting far too long and my feet are falling asleep. Hi. So um, I just want to piggyback on what some of these people have been talking about, these very intelligent people. Um, hi, I'm a second generation American. Uh, my mother was born in the Philippines. I'm half white, half Filipino. I am part of the browning of America. Um, yeah, I know. I, yeah. And you <laughs> I'm part of the third wave. And I just want to you know, share a little anecdote because my mother coming from the Philippines, one of these Asian countries, the reason she was able to immigrate to first to Canada, then to the United States is because she was one of the fortunate people in the Philippines to have one of these, um, what we would consider advanced degrees. In the Philippines, um, when you go to the hospital, chances are very high that one of your nurses is Filipino. Why? <laughs> That is something, that is an industry where they are pumping out nurses, the Philippines is pumping out nurses because they know that it's one of the few ways you can immigrate to the United States. We have a medical shortage in the US, especially of nurses uh, and doctors. So if you have a medical degree, if you have a nursing degree, you can absolutely immigrate pretty easily. And my family was fortunate because my mom's family, uh, her parents were teachers and were actually relatively well off compared to other Filipinos. Uh, so they were able to give her the opportunity to go to nursing school, to immigrate to the United States. Uh, same with her siblings. Where my heart really feels is for the Filipinos who cannot afford to go to nursing school or the you know, Central Americans who cannot afford um, to, they're the ones that are, that are facing the greatest amount of, of potential violence. Okay, sorry, let me get off my soapbox now. Let's talk elections. Okay, so elections in the United States, presidential elections in the United States for roughly the last 30 years have hinged on somewhere between six and 10 states each presidential election year. How many of you are, have already taken and completed US government? Okay. And how many of you are currently taking US government? All right. So I don't know where you are uh, in the syllabus, but we elect presidents not through a direct popular vote, right? You've heard the term the electoral college. Right? And uh, you know, political commentators will often call uh, the presidential campaign the race to 270 because 270 electoral college votes are what you need to clinch the presidency. Now, let's talk 2016. What happened in 2016? Trump won. Trump won. And this was at odds with just about every forecasting model that political scientists have relied on for the last 30 years to try to predict presidential election outcomes, okay? And this was a, v I mean, Trump's win was a surprise to most political scientists, to most political analysts, because that's just, it's not what the polls told us, except it was what the polls told us, because the media has a really bad habit, a really bad tendency to report the results of polls and report them incorrectly. <laughs> so the national polls said that Hillary Clinton was ahead of Donald Trump, right? That she was winning. And the fact of the matter is, she did win the popular vote, right? Where Chris was just men mentioned this earlier um, uh, on an aside. Hillary Clinton won somewhere between three to five million more votes than Donald Trump did. But she lost because of the Electoral College, right? So. Uh, Clinton was a flawed candidate, we know this, but even worse, her campaign was just a really bad campaign. Uh, historically, Michigan and Wisconsin have been battleground states, but starting, I want to say, I, I don't know about both states, but both states, uh, 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 both states definitely went to Obama 
in 2008 and 2012, and I think both states actually went to John Kerry in 2004 as well. But Hillary Clinton's campaign made this very poor assumption that they could sort of ignore Wisconsin, they could ignore Michigan, that they had those on lock, especially because of black voters. African Americans are the most solid group within the Democratic coalition. And it's not that black voters suddenly voted for Donald Trump in 2016. The bigger problem Clinton had among black voters in Michigan and Wisconsin was they didn't turn out to the polls. Right? They weren't as excited as uh, you know, they were in 28, or sorry, 2012 or 2008. And you know, projections have said that if black turnout was somewhere between 60 and 65 percent, she probably would have won those states. Right? Now, of course, there's probably issues with voter suppression, but we're not going to go there tonight. Um, but turnout among black voters ended up being somewhere around 55% in both states. And a lot of this was because Hillary Clinton didn't campaign in those states. She just assumed that she was going to win those states, okay? So when we look to 2020, again, the campaign is gonna hinge on a couple of states. We know historically, Iowa and New Hampshire are big battlegrounds, Florida, Ohio, Pennsylvania, right? And believe it or not, some people say Texas may very well be a battleground state. Why? Beto O'Rourke, really excited, certain segments of the electorate in Texas. The fact that Beto O'Rourke, as a Democrat, came within three points of an incumbent Republican senator, Ted Cruz, is just phenomenal. And how did that, how did that happen? What, what did it come down to? Turnout. It came down to turnout, especially among you all, all right? Um, young voting, young voters, uh, turnout is historically low, right? In midterm elections, if you get one in five 18 to 29 year olds show up to the polls, that's a good election year. And fact of the matter was, in 2018, youth voter turnout was three times higher than it is traditionally in midterm elections. So if young voter turnout is as high or higher in 2020, it is possible to flip Texas blue. Okay? But it's going to take young voters, and it's going to take the, <laughs> uh, what's the largest racial and ethnic group in Texas today? Hispanics. Yes, right. Hispanics, Latinos, right? Another, that's another group where historically there's just been lower levels of turnout when compared to African Americans and whites. So uh, we need high turnout levels among young voters, we need high turnout levels among Latinos. That's how Texas turns blue. Is it gonna happen? I'm not sure. But they've all encouraged you. Be smarter consumers, right? Y'all are the future. You can also change this election by not only making sure you show up to the polls, grab two friends and make it a party. Okay? Grab two friends, put them in the car, have a drinking game, I don't know, do whatever you want. Okay? Okay, sorry, only if you're 21. Just make sure they're registered to vote first. Yeah, register to vote Texas first. doesn't allow same-day voter one. registration. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, y'all, every time you move, you need to re-register to vote. So it's a big reason why young people are disenfranchised, because you, you don't know that, right? Every single time you move, you have to re-register to vote. Now, thankfully, Travis County makes it pretty easy. Uh, most of the time in Texas, you have to mail in uh, a new re voter registration card. Travis County actually lets you do some of this online, it, if you're moving within it, the same within, county. Within the county within the same county, right? Um, I don't know if Williamson does it, but regardless, right, just make sure that you're visiting the Travis County website um, and, and updating your address. If I can just add one little piece to that, one of the reasons that older people vote more than young people is they don't move. How often, when's the last time your grandparents moved? When's the last time you moved? So if you don't move, you stay registered to vote. But if you're moving from one apartment to another, it's an inherent, so mobility is an inherent uh, sort of voter suppression against young people. 
Yeah, that's definitely part of it. Also, political science research finds that um, voting is a habit. It usually takes three consecutive election cycles to form that habit. So, right, um, by the time you turn 25, 26 or so, that's really when that habit has developed, if you start once you turn 18. Okay, so Texas might be a battleground state, but again, what other state matters? What other states matter? And does it matter who the Democratic candidate is? Absolutely it does. Okay, so I mentioned that the national polls in 2016 sort of got it wrong, except they didn't. Right, this was the media misanalyzing the polls. Uh, what we need to be doing for 2020 is looking specifically at the state level polls, especially in these battleground states. And as of now, the early polls tell us that um, really a lot of it comes down to the top three. Uh, we've got Biden, we've got Sanders, and we've got Warren. Now in the national polls, Warren is starting to take the lead over Joe Biden. But I have to caution you because uh, in some of these uh, battleground states, in particular in Iowa, in Arizona, which might actually be a battleground, and in North Carolina, the only person who beats Donald Trump in a hypothetical head-to-head -head matchup is Joe Biden. Could this change? Yes, it could. But we also have to be cautious, right? When people say, oh, you know, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, right? Uh, these very liberal um, candidates, right? Uh, that they're not electable, that they're not viable. The reason they say this is because when you open it up to the entire uh, general population to vote, it's gonna be really hard for some of these candidates to pull, pull those moderate voters in, okay? So just keep in mind, uh, especially, <laughs> Texas. In Texas, Joe Biden and Beto O'Rourke, of all people, are the only two who beat Trump in a head-to-head -head poll. So. Christy, can yes. I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. uh, so, but the congressional elections, the midterms last mm -hmm. year, uh, did they demonstrate, though, that a lot of these moder moderate voters uh, find Trump very distasteful and that helped propel the Democrats back to control in the House? It, so would yes. those moderates, if the presumably Democratic candidate were mm -hmm. Warren or Sanders, a, a more progressive candidate, mm -hmm. would they still feel compelled to vote for Trump or would they just sit it out? That's really hard to predict because it was these moderate voters, we weren't sure if they were gonna break for Trump in 2016 also. So, so in 2018, mm -hmm. the districts that swung in the U.S. House were some moderate suburban districts. Mm -hmm. These were swing districts that and the swing, you mentioned young people, but a lot of it was suburban voters, mm -hmm. suburban women, yes. some of whom had voted for Trump, mm -hmm. were not voted, that came out in large numbers to support relatively moderate Democratic candidates yes. in, uh, in suburbs in Orange County, California, yeah. and Dallas. Cedar Dallas Park, Houston. Round Rock, uh, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. in, 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 house, in Texas House elections. Yeah. Uh, it, so the swing seemed to be in those suburbs mm -hmm. uh, more than any place else and it seemed to be the moderate candidates that, that were winning those swing districts. Right, exactly. So that, that's just you know, something to consider um, when we look at you know, who the, the Democratic candidate is uh, in 2020, right? If we have a very liberal figure like a, a Bernie Sanders or like an Elizabeth Warren, the big question is, who are these suburban voters going to break for? And at this, at this point, I am not sure if it's going to be that Democratic candidate if it's one of the uh, super liberal candidates. Somebody like uh, Mayor Pete, right, Pete Buttigieg, or uh, Amy Klobuchar, these more moderate figures, they poll better in some of the key battleground states, including Texas. So it's just something to, to keep your eye on. All right, and uh, at that point, I think I wanna open it up to questions, right? Oh, sure, go for it. All right, so my question is to you. What about older, individuals, how, how do you think they're going to vote in this upcoming election? I think a lot of it depends. Um, if Joe Biden is, so Joe Biden, he's winning support mainly among the older generations, right? And, and African Americans. And African Americans, right? And older people vote. Younger people don't as much, right? So, um, yeah, I, I think that if it's not Biden, 
it is going to be like a Mayor Pete or an Amy, Amy Klobuchar uh, figure for some of these people. I'm posing this to the group and to you too, Christy. Do you all, do you and do anyone out there think that in 2019, America is ready to elect an openly gay male who is married to a male? Do y'all think the country is ready? I can't, can't interpret the silence. We didn't have that class back in the dark ages when I was there. Yeah, do anyone out there think that this country is ready to elect an open, I got a hand over here, so the rest of you, I, I got three why, out of. Uh, Carl, why would the fact that he's a mayor be a disqualifying factor? I'm sorry? Why, why would the fact that he's a mayor be? You said openly gay mayor. No, oh, openly say gay mayor. Man. 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 Oh, openly gay man so, married to a man. So I, I, I would guess that's a very generational thing. I think yeah. people in this room don't care, but my question is, do your, would your grandparents care about, uh, about, would they be as willing to vote for an openly gay man as, as you are? And they would get out and vote. <laughs> I heard some, no how many no's are out there right, on your grandparents? Especially the South. Um, I don't know if the South would come out. Um, we tend to come be, out. you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> come out to vote. All right, so we tend to be very conservative. Um, so I'm socially. Not sh socially, yeah. I'm not really sure if the South would support them? I would be, I would have a reservation about whether a lot of the Midwest uh, voters would actually go out and vote for Mayor Pete. I mean, I like some of the things you're saying, but I just don't see this country being that progressive. In your generation, yes, but your generation do not get out and vote yeah. to the percentage my, my generation. I, I'd certainly like to believe that this country could. In 2008, I wasn't sure that this country was no, willing to is, elect an African-American man. I, in 2007, I was like, really? Are we, are, I, I, I'd like to believe we can elect Obama. I know this is, you know, you all were like 10 years old or younger, you know, at that point. And I wasn't sure for a, a long time and I was pleasantly surprised that we were. And I don't know, are we, the, are we the, at that place on sexual orientation today uh, that, that we could elect somebody like Mayor Pete, who incidentally is, in a sense, does challenge a lot of stereotypes of gay people. Mm -hmm. He's a military veteran. He is- Speaks seven languages. He's a Rhodes Scholar, is that he, correct? And, and, he is, yeah. and he is religious. Mm -hmm. he, he speaks in a religious language. Correct. And this does challenge some of the stereotypes that like the religious right people have, you know, when they look at, when they imagine what a gay person looks like. Mm -hmm. And so in a sense, he's almost a best case scenario, although I think a lot of people will also look at him, and maybe this gets to the mayor comment, that maybe he's not experienced, m m might try to rationalize their homophobia. In, he's young and inexperienced, yeah. and that might be their excuse yeah, for not voting for, you know, because they, they, <laughs> they won't want to say that they're... <laughs> sure. Yeah. But also, so Mayor Pete is mayor of South Bend, Indiana, and that is something that he is campaigning on hardcore. Like, hey, I'm from the Midwest. I understand the issues that people from the Midwest face. So um, I think he's definitely uh, trying to play up the Midwestern card. But I also, you know, you, you mentioned, um, you know, that you were surprised. You weren't sure that a black man could be uh, elected, right? Can we elect somebody uh, LGBT? Um, I'm not even sure that the country's ready for a woman. I was just gonna say right? that. We should be talking about yeah. that. We haven't she had did win more opposite votes. gender yet. Has yeah, been elected but president. there were some um, studies done after the fact when it comes to, I forget what it's called, like impl um, implicit, yeah, implicit masculinity or something like that, where there were a number of you know people who claimed to be progressive voters. This is true for both men and women who uh, using some implicit scales, so not asking people, hey, are you a sexist, are you a chauvinist, right? Because nobody's gonna admit to that. But using certain um, coded words and scales, uh, some, some sur uh, political scientists who uh, are experts in survey research found that Hillary Clinton probably lost somewhere between five to 7% of the vote simply because she was a woman, right? So. You know, if Elizabeth Warren, for example, were to win uh, the Democratic primary this time around, there's a possibility she would lose the general because she's a woman, right? Carl, my response to your question would be, uh, 
90% of the people in the United States live in urban areas today. And so I think that it's time we dispense with this idea that southern and midwestern voters, which is not where the majority of the country lives, their cultural values are going to continue to dictate the political direction of the United States. Um, the reality is the United States is changing whether people like it or not. The train is coming. It will continue to tr come. We're going to be a majority minority country, as you mentioned earlier. And people are just going to have to adapt to that or get out of the way because that's what the society is changing, whether they like it or not. And so myself, to speak to something you talked about earlier, every summer I attempt to be part of the Browning of the United States unsuccessfully, but I at least attempt. But that's coming, whether people want it or not. Foreseeable future is the Electoral College. Yes. And when you look at those Midwestern states that tend to go back and forth, I think a lot of the, my generation in the, in the Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Wisconsin, and Illinois, those, mid, those middle age are uh, older generation people. Can they won't take questions? it. Can, can I just add? Look, I, I want to add something question. also. But, yeah. um, I agree with you. And I will actually I say something to Christy related to that. Mm -hmm. Uh, ask her a question. Uh, the last seven presidential elections, people talk a lot about the United States being a conservative right country because oftentimes it is those southern and midwestern cultural values that seem to dictate the opinions of many Americans when in reality a lot of it has to do with turnout, particularly amongst the youth who often have more liberal cultural and social values. But when we look at this question of whether or not the United States is a center right country, seven excuse me, with six of the last seven presidential elections, the Democratic candidate has won the nationwide popular vote. Mm -hmm. and very close in 2004. 2004 was the only time the Democratic candidate lost the nationwide popular vote. And this is with not really substantial turnout except for 2008, 2012, when we broke 60%. So that clearly shows us culturally, uh, socially, in terms of val political values, the, you know, the United States is not necessarily a center-right country. But it is because of this anachronistic system known as the Electoral College, which the framers set up, that in large it was designed to protect the interests of slaveholding states and to choose our pre and to take power away from the people individually in terms of choosing the President of the United States, that we're stuck with that system that makes Republican candidates who are not necessarily moderate Republican candidates more uh, competitive because of the Electoral College and will continue to be so. And of course, that's something that would require the cooperation of all of the states to change, and uh, the Republican Party is fully aware of that. Can I just add something to that, which is, well, the argument you're making is we're a non-voting country, and part of the issue is that the groups that vote for Democrats are less likely to vote. Young people and minorities and low-income people, these are the groups that are much more likely, people with less education are, are, are less likely to vote. The groups that vote Republican are more likely to vote. And, and then just another comment, you know, we're talking about differences in region, but the, I think the real differences within the United States are urban versus rural right now. I think that's, it, it's becoming a greater divide even yeah, than I'm, it was I mean, 15 I, years ago. I mean, look at Texas, and the Democrats won all the cities, and, and we lost, you know, Be, you know, Beto won like 20 counties, mm -hmm. but they were all the urban counties and a few of the suburban counties kind of breaking through in Williamson and Tarrant. But, but the cities, Travis County, Houston, San Antonio, Dallas, they were winning overwhelmingly. And this is going on all over the country, where Democrats are winning in cities, winning in, in some of the more liberal suburbs, but the further you get out from the city, you know, the, great, the, greater, the, the less dense the population, the, the more the Republicans are winning. It's a religious divide, it's a cultural divide about issues like guns and religion and immigration and all of these sorts of issues between the urban and the rural areas. Yeah, so and, and just like to get back to this uh, point Chris made, you know, with the Electoral College. Um, Which favors the rural areas. It right? absolutely favors rural, rural areas, it absolutely favors red states. So take a state like Wyoming. Wyoming has about half a million people <laughs> living in the entire state. We have more people living in the city of Austin than in the entire Twice. state of Wyoming, Twice right? Wyoming. Yeah, so the fact is that those 500,000 people in Wyoming have an outsized voice when it comes to selecting the president, right? And that's gonna continue in the foreseeable future as people, right, more liberal people, mm -hmm. Democrats, flee to the cities and create 
you know, I think Austin is the perfect example of this. We are an island of blue in a sea of red, right? And yeah. this island of blue is very, very crowded, while the sea of red is not so. So, yeah. We've been talking to each other. Uh, you know, we want to make sure that you all get to ask some questions. You all, we're in the South. Yeah. Somebody's going to have to bring a microphone around. Or, or you have to shout. <laughs> no, I'll bring a microphone. Okay. Wait, hold on. Some people like to chant in their ears. Oh, oh Chris! <laughs> Thanks, Chris! <laughs> wow. Yeah, not good. Okay. Um, so Trump won white women by a not insignificant margin in 2016. Do you think that will change, um, considering, like, some people are saying the economy is booming and jobs are increasing? Do you think that will change in 2020? Do you think white women will choose a Democratic candidate? More? And, like, considering that... One of the front runners is a white woman again. Um, so, sorry, you said uh, Trump won white woman? Yeah, yes, that's true. Yeah, and white women in particular were uh, sort of the big swing group. It was it was very unclear going into 2016 who would they vote, who they would vote for. But um, among the people who uh, switched their party vote in 2018 were white women, especially white women with college degrees. Um, economy doesn't matter as much to white women, right? Uh, when we look at the, at the issues that are important to them, um, family, children, that, I mean, the, the putting kids in cages was a big reason why um, Trump lost white women in, in 2018. So um, I, I want to be cautiously optimistic and say that white women will continue to not vote for Donald Trump. I don't want to say that they're going to, you know, enthusiastically say, yeah, we really support the Democratic candidate. But in U.S. elections, it really comes down to the lesser of two evils, really, um, for most people. And I think that, at least for that demographic, um, it, it's, they're going to lean more towards the Democrat, I suspect. Don't quote me. Another consideration with regard to female white voters in states like Texas, where evangelical vote is considerable, um, there's often a lot of pressure coming from their spouses to align their votes with their spouse's vote, particularly in the evangelical community. And as a result of that, that sometimes will often sway the choice that they might make. Of course, they don't have to tell their husband how they voted, when, <laughs> since it is a secret ballot. Uh, there's somebody else who has a question? Can you pass the microphone? So in the Electoral College, Wyoming does have a larger vote. So say you switch the ballot to a popular vote, how do you convince rural areas like, say, Wyoming, how do you convince them that they still have a voice in the national election, especially when, you know, states like California already eat up a ton of the ton of electoral votes, you know, already have a ton of people that can really sway the election. How do you convince those in rural areas that their voice still matters? This is part of the problem. And you need three quarters of the states to agree to a constitutional amendment. So it makes it very hard. The, essentially, those rural states have almost a veto over the ability to change the constitution in order to go to, from, say, the electoral college to direct popular vote. So you put your finger on a real problem. Uh, how do you convince them? I'm, I'm not sure. I, I think, you know, I mean, anyone have thoughts on that? I don't think you can because to them, they would be, they would perceive it as giving up power. This is the one leverage that I have, as someone that mentioned earlier, uh, in meeting about uh, Kim Jong-un. Why should I give up my nuke when I saw what happened to the last guy who gave up here? Why should, if you put your sho yourself in Wyoming's shoes, why should they give up this power that they have and they know once it's gone, I'm irrelevant? I, 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 would, I would add also that the overrepresentation of rural states didn't really change the outcome in 2016. It did in 2000 when Bush won 271 to 267. It really didn't, it made a bigger difference in that election. Trump won by enough votes that it wouldn't have really mattered if the if states had been represented closer to um, to the representation, but it definitely mattered a lot in 2000. 
Well, and the other thing I would say is, you know, we're focused so much on this one campaign, on, pr on the president, right? When in domestic politics, the president doesn't matter that much, right? When we talked about how, you know, the president is really powerful when it comes to foreign policy, but when it comes to local and state issues, it's all about Congress, right? It's all about voting for your local representative or your state representative. And that's how you convince rural voters, hey, maybe you're not gonna win presidential elections all the time, but you still show up and vote at the polls and you better believe that your representative is going to be somebody whose values and ideology aligns closer to your own. So the immigration process, like we know it's really difficult and time consuming. Um, so I just wonder what are the dangers of making it easier and how can we find that balance where it is easier for people to immigrate here and gain citizenship, but there's still some kind of stability in our government and economy? I don't know if that made sense. Hmm. Uh, I would, um, I would maybe say what Mr. Mullen was talking about, perhaps this browning. Um, if we were to make it easier, um, I don't know. I'm gonna have to pass. I'm gonna put this. And there was a, a, a phrase that I think was Malcolm X says, I'm not for sure, but he says, no, it was Frederick Douglass. Power concedes nothing without demand. And the people, whether it was you, me, or anyone who holds the power, you're not gonna willingly give it up. And so if a, a group that's in power and sees perceive whether it's real or imagined, this new group of uh, immigrants coming in, they perceive them as a threat. They're gonna be frightened by it, and their reaction is gonna be, stop them, don't let them in. That's just human nature, I make it more difficult. If I can add to that, there's always been a trend of, of what's called nativism in America, a distrust of the new immigrants. There's always, either because they were taking our jobs, we've heard that, or because they were a threat to our security. You know, we've heard that more around Muslims, where the Mexicans, we've heard more of they're taking our job. So there's always been, um, you know, we've always wanted immigrants to come in, and it's mostly about ch cheap labor. Legal, illegal, doesn't matter. It's, you know, legal, document, un undocumented. You know, it's, it's always, there's always been an economic interest in having that supply of cheap labor renewed, but we've, but there's always also been these people are different, they look different, they eat different things. Prohibition was about, had a lot to do with immigration. There was, they were prohibiting, they, they thought that all of these immigrants coming in drink uh, these hard liquor. And, uh, you know, and, and they did, the, the sort of the white church ladies didn't trust that. And that's, that was a big part of that. So there's always been this mix. I guess, the way, to me, the way you fix it is you convince people that what the Statue of Liberty stands for and that these values of give me your tired, your, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free are the essence of America. Donald Trump and Stephen Miller, if some people may know that name, his sort of aide is the guy who's writing a lot of his immigration policies, you know, are trying to sort of change the American ethos around immigration. Um, and I think you try to convince people the immigrants are a source of renewal in the United States. Immer you know, like you were talking about your family story. I know, you know, I doubt my ancestor, my Jewish ancestors from Eastern Europe would have gotten in if they had been told they had to have, have a college degree and speak English. So, but, and, and, and have health insurance and never be a public charge. So, you know, this, so I, I think it's about, yeah, make, making people understand that, you know, everybody except, and oddly you didn't mention involuntary immigration of African Americans when you were talking. But yeah, but um, but besides, uh, you know, African Americans and Native Americans, everybody is descended from voluntary immigration to the United States, and that's the essence of our values and the essence of our economic success has come in immigration. Yeah. So I guess I'm just wondering, like, on the flip side of that. So if we were to make immigration a lot easier, what's the danger in that, and how can we maintain stability, like, as a country? if we're allowing people to come in easily. Does sure. that make sense? 
Yeah, uh, well, I would just say that all of the research done on immigration studies has clearly demonstrated that immigrants are a net gain for society, economically, specifically. They're a net gain. We don't do a good enough job of disseminating that information, particularly when it's being counteracted by certain media outlets that project alternative information. Um, but I would also say that the, one of the challenges that, that we face is that we're dealing with really two different systems in which people have to play. Because in reality, you all, we all live in a very globalized world, but it's not fully globalized for everyone. For the investor class, for big business, for corporations, it's a truly integrated and truly globalized world. They don't have boundaries and borders to where they can invest, where they can ship wealth, where they can pursue trade and business and economic exchange. But to workers, particularly workers from certain countries who don't have assets, who don't have careers, who don't have homes, who don't have anything to demonstrate to an immigration, to a, a State Department official for why they should be given a tourist visa, they have obstacles. There's bureaucracy. They have immigration documents and visas and passports and all the things that go along with that. So they're really being forced and compelled to play, a, play uh, economic survival in a system that the elite economic class does not have to play by those same rules. For example, if you invest $500,000 in the United States, you automatically can be granted a green card in this country, right? So that's just one example. So a potential solution to the problem, as, as I see it, and this is just purely my opinion, which I think there will be a lot of disagreement over this, I think Europe gave us a clue. That was a continent for centuries that was afflicted by war and afflicted by chaos and violence and uh, terrible relations and culminating in two major world wars. And then they realized the solution was to create a common union and, and get rid of barriers to immigration. And it's been, to varying degrees, successful. So I think we need to have a similar type union of the Americas. And I think that will help uh, solve some of those problems because Greece and Portugal and Spain were three of the poorest countries in Europe historically for centuries until they became EU member states. And their standard of living increased, which then diminished the reason for Greeks and Portuguese and Spaniards to want to leave their country. So if we had a America-style union of the Americas, and of course we don't have ownership over that term, by the way, you know that, right? Uh, extending from north, you know, the Arctic Circle all the way down to Tierra del Fuego, we could then basically uh, lift the standard of living of countries like Haiti and Bolivia and El Honduras and El Salvador and others so that the same thing would happen. Their motivation to want to leave, which many of them don't want to leave, but economic circumstances force them to, would be diminished. And so that might be a possible solution. But in order for that to happen, you're going to have to convince a lot of people within this country, particularly those of the working class, that they don't need to view immigrants as a threat. And you really see, and this will be the last point I'll make on this and I'll shut up, you really see the difference here when you look at, for example, a Norwegian construction worker who's a union member who says to a pole that comes to Norway and works in that same job, I don't feel threatened by you. I want you to have the same benefits and same salary that I have so you're not exploited. So join our union and we'll protect each other in a sense of solidarity. In the United States, due to our history of racism and discrimination, there's a level of scapegoating that exists, and we target those that are the most vulnerable. Why is it that those with advanced degrees, PhDs, and master's degrees tend to be the least resistant to immigration? Because they don't feel threatened by immigrants in terms of their jobs and their economic livelihood. So we have to do a better job of convincing those that do feel threatened that they have the same objectives and they don't have to see those others as a threat. Uh, one th Hi. Okay, so I also want to take uh, this from a different perspective as well. So, uh, the rate of childbirth in the United States is declining, right? And we also know from public opinion surveys that there are certain industries and certain fields that young people in the United States don't want to do. The week after Donald Trump got elected, there were tomato farms in Alabama that had all of their tomatoes go rotten because they went unpicked. Because any time these farms would try to hire Americans to do the labor, Americans were like, 
man, this is shitty. I have to be out here in 100 degree heat for eight hours a day at the wages they pay? Oh, hell no, I don't want to do that. So there are certain industries that we need the efforts of immigrants to, to just keep us from paying $10 per tomato at the grocery store. But the second thing to consider is social security, which is projected to be insolvent, right, by 2033. So Carl mentioned the baby boomer generation, huge generation, more and more people are retiring every day going on social security. The, the millennial generation, by the way, is bigger than the baby boomer generation. And if y'all want social security to exist by the time you reach the age of, it's not gonna be 65, so, sorry to say it, most of you are gonna be working till 70. Yeah, yeah, most, yeah. Most of y'all are gonna be working till at least you're 70. That's the only way social security is going to exist at, at the uh, time of retirement. The only other way it remains even feasible or viable is with an influx of new workers. Okay, we need people to replace um, the baby boomer generation, right? Because again, you know, millennials are having children later. I suspect the same is gonna be true for Gen Z because like Carl said, younger generations have it really rough right now. So, so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Universal basic income. Okay, my husband is a Andrew Yang, but I'm not, you're, don't even get me started on UBI. <laughs> but, right, uh, just, just consider there are, you know, downstream stream economic advantages to having uh, large numbers of immigrants come to the United States. Any other questions? Wow. Great questions, by the way. Yes. All right, so yes, thank you guys for coming and participating. Well, you guys have a great evening.